the question is, we can't find skilled workers. Why can't we find skilled workers? And how are you guys able to find them? Hello again and welcome to the Skill Work Forum where we gather and talk about all things uh, surrounding the skilled trades, how to, how to find the guys, how to get them into your location, uh, really just everything uh, associated with not only your business but our business which is doing just that, finding the right guys for your organization to help you get the stuff done you need to do every day. Um, I'm joined with my partner Brett. Uh, my name is Tim from Skill Work, and today we're going to talk about trying to address some questions that we routinely get, and really it's, it revolves around the question is, we can't find skill workers, why can't we find skill workers, and how are you guys able to find them? So we thought we'd cover four uh, questions or four reasons we think that are really driving this skill trades gap. Many of them are intuitive, many of you probably already know. We just thought we would address each of these. They're real, they're issues, they're gonna to continue to persist, and maybe some things uh, that we might offer and how we're going about trying to solve them. So obviously it's not exist, ex uh, an exhaustive list, but uh, definitely things that we see as consistent uh, throughout the period we're in right now. So the first one of the four we're covering is this nationwide shortage of skilled trades currently at 1 million probably north of that and projected to be 2 million by 2025 and we think that actually maybe 2 million sooner than 2025 so this one is kind of a no-brainer everyone knows that we have a gap out there the numbers can be a little bit you know uh sobering when you think about it um but there's a double whammy that we see going on here with this, Brett. And first, there's a demand side. There's an increasing demand. And then the supply side, there's a decreasing supply. So you want to talk about that in, in, from the demand side of things? And what are your thoughts on that? No, oh, for sure. Yeah, no, it, like you said, Tim, it's, you know, it's, um, there's a lot of data out there that, that supports the shortage. You know, it's pretty undeniable, um, in, especially the more skilled you get, you know, you know, there may, you could debate a little bit, you know, if there's people that are willing to do construction labor, um, but, but as you get into the more skilled trades, meaning electrical, plumbing, mechanical, technicians, um, diesel mechanics, those things that we really hone in on a lot, we do some in the construction labor as well, but really more so in that technical, it's pretty undeniable um, that currently we're at at least a million um, short of what the total need is. I mean, every facility we talk to says, "Yeah, I'm short. I can't find people." So right. it's kind yeah. of a it's kind of a known thing. And to your point, Tim, the bigger concern where I think people have really started to um, engage us in the conversation and assisting them is. This isn't a, something, you know, sometimes you you say, well, you know, I like to use the term, you know, the pearl's not worth the dive. You know, if, if the problem is short term and it's going to go away, you know, are we really going to go to all this trouble to, right. to, to fix it? You know, probably not. Um, but when you've got a skilled trade gap that is projected to, to actually double over the next five years, give or take, even less than five years now, then it's it's a growing problem, not a shrinking problem. The obvious, um, the biggest driver of that, you know, you know, is the, just this fact of the majority of the people in the skilled trade space now are the baby boomer generation, right? And and that generation is scheduled to begin to retire over the next five to seven years, and there's been a lot of impact of COVID. But COVID accelerated some of that retirement. So what was, we're probably going to get to that 2 million gap faster than they thought sure. because a lot of those people are not coming back yeah. um, for a variety of reasons, health or, or so forth yeah. in that. So, so that kind of talks about, you know, just the reality that um, demand is high, supply is, is, is shrinking, the number of of uh, younger generations, just it's a pure numbers game, you know. Yeah. You know, you know. Tim's heard me say I'm kind of the numbers guy here. He 
he, you know, that uh, numbers don't lie, people do. And <laughs> so, um, so, you know, it's clearly a numbers game. If you have this many people leaving the workforce that are skilled trades and this many coming in and, and the number outs bigger than the number coming in, it creates a shortage. You know, it's pretty hard to deny. Yeah. So um, any thoughts on that? Well, you know, you know, it's interesting as we start looking at this, you think about demand. What What's driving the demand for more skilled craftsmen because you think looking around that, well, isn't everything getting more automated and highly technical and you know, we've, we've, we've now advanced and we don't, there should be less demand for this. But some of the things we found is, you know, they measure productivity. Uh, productivity is just simply how much you produce in versus labor hours to produce it. And that number is actually flat, if not going mm-hmm. down. So companies are being less productive, which is counterintuitive because you think with all this technology that you're going to be more productive. Mm-hmm. So we started digging into this and 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 the reason why one of the things driving i need more productivity is going down because i think it's it's kind of a it's kind of a circular deal you're getting less quality less skilled people to do your job which means you're spending more time training more time you know turnover you're actually less productive because of that Mm -hmm. so it's driving that so productivity which i found really interesting is driving that we need more people because our productivity is down. We're not able to, to meet the output. So that's that's an interesting thing. And you talked also, Brett, about this, um, the demand on the on the uh, supply chain, that there's less offshore, more onshore. How does that gonna drive? Yeah, we're demand? seeing it. I mean, you know, we're talking to facilities now and the, the demand, uh, on the supply side, you know, we do a lot in the food manufacturing space. Obviously, that was a really critical space, has been, continues to be through through COVID. Um, but manufacturing in general, because if, if I'm making, whether I'm making a juice in a bottle or whether I'm making a package of bacon, all of that then has a lot of ancillary businesses, manufacturing businesses that are creating glass bottles and, and cardboard or corrugated and you know paperboard, all these types of things. All of these businesses are seeing huge demand. And, and what we've seen is, is, Tim, to your point, you would think the productivity would be up. Um, the reality is, is to your point, it's it's not it just isn't and so so when we talked to plants I was talking to a plant that we we have that we do work with the other day and they said that right now they're running about sixty five to seventy percent efficiency you know they need to be at ninety yeah and and it's simple they said we just can't we can't find the talent to keep the lines running the 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 reality is 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 the the plants are trying to be more efficient. Putting more production workers in the facility doesn't make you more efficient. It makes you more expensive, <laughs> but but it doesn't make you more efficient. Where the real efficiency comes from, we're going to get into it a little bit more here in a minute on, a, on, on the advancement of technology, but, but in order to maximize or, or achieve that efficiency, you know, it just... It just requires a skilled talent to be able to keep that equipment running. So these plants are feeling a huge push and a huge demand to run more efficient, to get more product out, to get more supplies out. Um, And there's a real backlog right now because there's been plants that have had to shut down for a little while. They've had a hard time getting raw material in. And so there's right now we're in a a time where efficiency is probably at its biggest need you know, the other thing, you know, on the demand side, too, is is projections are now starting to show, you know, um, in 2020, clearly probably the, the area that we get involved in that felt the biggest hit was probably construction. And, and so the demand in that area was definitely down. Um, but now the backlog of construction projects is there and they really believe with the vaccines rolling out and the numbers coming down and all the other things that, that, that 
demand on that con- that construction work is really going to going to go up as we get you know further into 2021. Yeah, a couple other th- comments on the demand, then we'll look at the supply side. So we talked about you said raw materials, a lot of plants. I mean, there's a global marketplace, a lot of plants, a lot of you know construction. Not, doesn't matter what business you're in, you are probably at some point in your supply chain dependent on offshore materials to what you do. For instance, I just bought or I ordered a utility vehicle, you know, a little side-by-side utility vehicle for my for my place. They actually assemble them for all, the whole United States in a town that's about 30 miles away from where we live. So you would think I could just pop down there and grab one. Well, they assemble them there, but all the parts come from different components, many from offshore. Well, that supply chain has really been bogged down because of COVID and restrictions. Mm-hmm. So they're they're backlogged to, to be able to, to produce that. And as those things begin to pick up, you know, then then that's just going to further put more demand on catching up. Yep. So that we're going to see that as well. So there's a lot of things that uh, that impact demand. The bottom line is. The need for skilled tradesmen is going up. That's that we can't argue that. Now, as far as supplying that need, um, you mentioned already the exodus of the baby boomers. Yep. That's definitely happening. Um, the proliferation of baby boomers retiring is going to continue through 2030. The numbers are staggering. If you just quick do a Google search, you know how many baby boomers are retiring in the next decade. It is just like wow, and that is a lot of experience out the door. And the problem is the growth in uh, people to replace that working age population is flat or down. So it's just simply not there. The, the, the ability to even be, even if you had folks that were interested in the skilled trades, there's not as many of them being produced. Mm-hmm. Families are having less kids. So that's an issue um, as far as supply goes. Some other things we talked about, Brett, is this. You know, the government has tried to do a lot of things to help us get through COVID. One of the things that they've done uh, has been provide resources to companies like the PPP was a big deal for us. Individually, all of you out there probably got a check in your banking account, uh, maybe a couple, maybe three over the last few months. Well, that actually, the proliferation of those dollars going into accounts, that actually has diminished the desire uh, and need for people to go find work. So there's been a disappointing recovery because people are simply choosing not to go out and work. I mean, you got five grand that lands in your bank account. Maybe I'm not going to go do that interview today. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just human nature. So a couple other things that are, are, are hitting the supply side. you got the baby boomers, the working age, uh, the labor um, participation, Disability rates are higher than they've ever been. People are not able to work high demand physical jobs because of disability rates. People are taking advantage of that opportunity. And then just that we've talked about it multiple times, Brett, and maybe you can expand on the fact that young people are just not going into the trades. Yeah, they're just not. I mean, it's, you know, there's a lot of talk about it. You know, um, you know I commend and, and totally respect the, the work that Mike Rowe has done, you know, from Dirty Jobs, you know, he continues to be a champion in talking about the need for more people and the opportunity to go into the trades. Um, but the reality is, is it's still nowhere near where it needs to be. It gets a lot of talk. <laughs> um, it, it The actuality of the number of, of the percentage of, of high school uh, youth that are choosing to go into the trades versus that are going still going to uh, a university is still uh, a, a big gap of where it needs to be. Yeah, I mean, you go to any high school, how many of them are focusing on vocational training versus how many are putting all their time and effort into getting kids ready for the SAT or ACT or college prep or college preparatory class? Everything is is funneling kids to that. Every conversation we have with people our age, or people that have school age children, it's all talking about what college are they going to, you know, what scores they get in the ACT. It's all of that, and that there's nothing wrong with that. I I applaud higher education, but the problem is that 
many of them are going down that path with no real desire or at the end of that having an opportunity mm-hmm. to be employed and yep. and you know so so it's it's something that that we need to to continue to focus on on letting young people know that not only is there opportunity but there's honor and value in going to trades and a pretty nice paycheck we have some of our guys that are making yeah. pretty dang good money out there oh you yeah, know, no, with yeah. Skill trades. yeah i mean it's an obvious i mean many people talk about it i mean it's it's for a lot of people i don't know it's it's not a money decision because you're going to take on a lot more debt obviously to go to to go to a four-year college and you're going to come out and make no obviously there's exceptions to everything you know if you're if there, a lot of people are going to come out with a business degree or a further, you know, uh, uh, you know, a PhD or a, a doctor or lawyer, or whatever. And, and in those cases, that's that's a different thing. But a lot of people, the, the comparison of, of what they're going to make compared to to your point, Tim, <laughs> these trade guys, you know, do very very well. But I think it's just a mindset change that's that's very very slow to change. It, we, you know, we we told everybody for the last twenty years you know, um, that this is what you, you need to go on and get a, a college education. We now know that probably wasn't the best thing to tell everybody, but it's hard to wind it back. So, yep. so we need to keep talking about it. We need to keep encouraging people. We need to keep, you know, supporting um, and, and showing people the opportunity. Uh, we have a lot of great young guys that work for us. Um, so the idea that, um, Oh, these millennials, you know, they don't want to work. They just want to blah, blah, blah. You know, I don't, you know. I'm, we don't buy that. We don't buy that. No, <laughs> no, and no. So. it's not, it's not, a, it's not a work ethic. It's a opportunity. And, and it's, it's really on all of us to make sure that we honor the skill trades and, and, and celebrate that as a, as a path. So we spent a lot of time talking about the first, you know, reason why it's hard to land people in skill trades, because I think that's the most important and obvious, but the next one we want to talk about is just on the on the recruiting side of things. Uh, companies like you maybe are listening uh, in terms of finding these skill trades. Why is it so hard? So number two is we call it bringing a sword to a gunfight. It's using these old systems and all the processes, approaches to solve what we think is a very much an evolving problem. So can you speak into that one? These companies, whether it be construction or whether it be manufacturing or other spaces where they truly believe it. I've, I mean, I've literally looked at some owners of companies or presidents of companies, and the look in their face is, is hopeless. <laughs> I mean, they, they literally don't see a path to how they're going to find the talent. You know, That's they true. look at us like, you know, like, like we're kidding. Like, yeah, no, we can help you. We can help you find the talent. And, and so, you know, but... The irony in that is that so many of them um, just continue to do the same thing or they continue to even double down on more of the same thing, you know. Um, And so, you know, by the same thing, I mean, you know, traditional hiring, you know, you know, I've said it on this podcast many times, you know, I spent 35 years in the in the food manufacturing space and you know to be honest with you you know we hired or attempted to hire people the same way all 35 years of my time there and and so which was you know put an ad in the the paper i know that sounds really archaic but um but you know what's the uh, (laughs) point exactly to uh but basically trying to attract local people to come to our facility to 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 work. The challenge with that, and then, you know, this is the part that that you know we would say is a, is a little bit crazy or doing the same thing. You know, the whole insanity. You know, comment and doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. But not only are they doing the same thing, they continue to look in this same pool, knowing there's nothing there. Um, but then in addition, then they, they go out and they hire uh, recruiting managers and talent acquisition people internally. So they drive up their HR costs to basically just put more, more energy into the same model. Our challenge or our uh, challenge to you, I guess, would be the way to say it is 
we really would encourage you to, to think outside that box. I mean, we have, you know, um, you know, we have a different model. You know, we don't usually unpack our model a whole lot on these podcasts. It's really more to think broader. But I think in this case, it probably plays a little bit more. We can talk about that here in a second. Um, but you have to look beyond the way you're currently trying to solve the skilled trade gap. You've got to think differently. There is talent out there, I can assure you. We, we, we find it every day, we place it every day, and we're not just throwing bodies at problems. We're, we're putting truly qualified talent to fit the need, and there is a process, there is a way to do it, um, and that's, you know, after 35 years of watching us and, and me watching the trend of how what we were continuing to do was failing is really what led to say we've got to, as an, as an industry, as a manufacturing as a construction industry, we have to start to think differently to this problem. We have to provide a different model to, the, to, to some percentage of this talent to attract them to this space. Yeah, so. for sure. I just had a... Uh a thought, a picture in my head when you were talking about that, using the similar approach and expecting a different outcome. And, you know, it's like fishing. You're a big fisherman. I'm a hunter. It's like five years ago, I had a place where there were always pheasants and quail. And and it looks awesome. Yeah. And there hasn't been any birds there in four years. But I keep going back because it looks amazing. And I had a result there before. So it's like, well, they have to. Surely this time. Surely this time. And it's amazing how when, when we find success doing something, we want to go back to that and go back to that, go back to that. And, and you know, it's the smart individual that says, maybe we should try something different. Yep. And that's really what's happening here. So our model is different. Matter of fact, um, you, we just did a webinar uh, a little while back. You can, I think you can find the link on our website. Uh, it'll be there for you, but we talked extensively about our approach. And, uh, you know, some people say, why in the world would you tell people how you do things? You know, isn't that kind of giving away your secret sauce? And we, we're not, we're not, uh, it's not rocket science what we do. It's very thorough and it takes time and effort, but we have a, a, a very specific approach. You know, we search national, we search nationally, sometimes internationally. We treat skilled workers differently. We really value them. We treat them with respect. We think that they have a big say in their future, and we, we, we honor that. A lot of choice, a lot of freedom, a lot of flexibility. The bottom line is we do things differently in order to um, try to solve this problem. We have to uh, because the old way of doing things is not working. And I think the smart company would look at that and recognize maybe we should try something different. So the third issue, so we talked about you know, there's a shortage. There's the process needs to change. The third thing is that there is a rapid evolvement going on of skill levels and the areas of expertise. It's changing and it's going to continue to change. We talked about this in the last podcast. Hit the link. Go back to episode 27. We talked about it in the fourth industrial revolution. And this is a big deal. And we think it's going to be, maybe it's not a big a problem today. It's part of it. But if you don't pay attention to this one, this is going to continue to impact going forward because uh, we're in this what what some people have and and that study this are calling the fourth industrial revolution, as I mentioned. So there was the steam engine, so power, electricity, and everything that came along with electricity and power through that medium, computer age, which we're on kind of fully in now and on the tail end of that. And then that's fourth one that we're in now that's going to affect the ability to find skilled tradesmen. It's just the Internet of Things, the highly connected ecosystems of uh, of your companies. So. Yep. Nope. I mean, we like Tim said, you know, go back and, and, and listen to that episode. Like I said, it was a previous one, 27. We talk in somewhat detail about, you know, not so much about the fourth industrial revolution because we're not tech guys. Um, you know, we're more problem solvers, and 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 so, but we talk about uh, the impact this is going to have um, on the skilled trade problem that you're already having. And so, the reality for many, many 
and this is probably pertains primarily to manufacturing, but but the reality is there's not a company that we talk to who uh, who isn't struggling to find frontline workers, and and in and, and it's a much uh, in just a pure scale, it's a much larger number, um, you know. 50, 80, 100, 200 people that they can't yeah. find in this plant. They're not going to, if you go back and if you just look at, you know, pure population growth tells you this problem isn't going away. <laughs> and so there isn't going to be enough humans to fill the jobs. So, so you have to, uh, over the next, I don't know if it's going to be, tomorrow or it's going to be 20 years from now, but it's going, the process, the technology is there, just like there was a lot of things, you know, that until the smartphone came to be, there were certain things that you couldn't do, like, you know, ride share and, and all these different things. Once the technology was there, it was an, it was inevitable that eventually those businesses, those industries were going to shift. Yeah. We believe that this is an inevitable move that manufacturing is going to move to a, to a more predictive, more efficient system utilizing the technology. And I think the reason why it's, it's almost guaranteed is because of this reality is they, they can't, there is not enough frontline workers to fill out centers. So you have to run more efficiently. You have to run, you have to automate more things. You have to to do all these things to maximize right. and create flexibility. Well, to do that, you have to have a, uh, a higher level of skill. That You don't need near as many of them uh, for skilled trades as you do for frontline workers, but their skill set and their uh, importance for these, these facilities to, to continue to run efficiently is going to just continue to, oh, yeah. to elevate. Yeah, so. yeah. So it's every industrial revolution uh, necessarily meant that there was a dying out of previous capability and skills. I mean, when you went to the steam engine, the guys that could repair and make wagon wheels or wagons, you know, they they didn't have a job anymore. And the people that you know were creating steam engines and paddle wheel boats and so forth, they needed a different set of skills. Same thing's going to apply. So. There's going to be a shrinking pool of people able and capable to do that. So it's going to exacerbate this issue as we go forward. But we see opportunity in this. There's going to be an opportunity to attract a new generation. The previous issue we talked about is getting young people excited about coming in the trades. The more technology, the more AI, the more advancement. We think that there's going to be opportunity for companies that are thinking about this of starting to partner with schools and training uh, facilities to bring in that higher tech need. So that's a big one. We think that's a rapidly evolving skill level associated with the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth and final thing we want to talk about, and we probably hear this from our skilled workers more than anything else, is that frustration over what they perceive as a stagnation or lagging rise in their wages. And studies bear this out and um, that there has traditionally been a lag when when we have an economic boom or growth. Blue collar, so-called blue collar workers are usually the last to benefit for that. And that's been the way things have been, but we are starting to see that trend change a little bit where uh, I may not feel like it right now, but statistically over the last two to three years, wages as we're experiencing the supply and demand are beginning to be on the rise for skilled craftsmen. And we want it, We want to be on the forefront of that, frankly. We believe that skilled tradesmen, craftsmen, they deserve that. The value they bring is, is unquestionable. Your need for them is unquestionable. And if you're a skilled tradesman listening to this, we get it. We hear you and we do everything we can to make sure that the clients we work with understand that you're not going to be able to track in a shrinking pool of supply, if you want to fight for the best and brightest, and you're going to have to make sure that you um, give them the, an equitable salary or wage that 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 is uh, deserving, that they deserve. So companies are recognizing the days of a $15, $18 an hour electrician 
it just ain't it's not happening <laughs> that dog won't hunt go back to the hunting yeah. analogy right it just ain't gonna happen and yep. and we're finding clients that we try to do that for them and they either get you know frankly the quality is not there they're looking for we're not we're not able to attract the right one so you got to pay this and we believe that stagnation in blue collar wages is improving but it is currently as we speak today still a thing no doubt i mean it's it's a uh... It's an issue, um, uh, like you said, Tim. We are seeing the the trend. We have a lot of you know companies, and I think they're genuine in asking. I think they're trying to understand what is the prevailing wage out there, and we can provide that information. You know, my dad, you know, uh, who was a, an ammonia refrigeration expert. I would, you know, I'm, I'm I'm biased, but I would say in his day, he was probably the best in the country, and and. And he, so he was one of the smarter skilled trade guys I ever knew. And he would always, he always used to tell me way back when I was, was, was running plants at an early age that good people will always pay for themselves. And I think that's the thing with these skilled trade guys. When you talk about the cost and the, um, or the loss of money for not running your plant efficiently, you know, paying a, a high talented, Main scale because you don't have 500 of them in your in your facility. You've got you know maybe 50, you know, or or in some plants you know 10. Um, and so paying them a fair wage or even more than a fair wage, a good wage, the payback for that. I mean, it's like yeah. you know, I give you a dollar, you give me a hundred. I mean, it's 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 easy math, and I don't sometimes how we as companies. You know, we get caught up on on what that front end cost is, and kind of lose our way on what what it's really costing us. Yeah. I mean, we see stats all the time that say, you know, the you know the an average hour of downtime in a manufacturing plant costs a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, so. I mean, it, it it seems to be intuitive, but we see it all the time that well, Benjamin Franklin famously said, "Penny wise and pound foolish," and you know, in, in today's vernacular. You know, you're focusing and pinching pennies, and you're losing dollars at the other end. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't make sense. So invest on the front end, and and give these skill workers the wage that they deserve for what they're bringing, the value they're bringing to your company. It's not just manufacturing; it's construction, it's it's all of the other services that we provide for. Whether you're out there in the wind energy, uh, solar energy, some of these new emerging companies that we see. Um, we need to make sure that we recognize it, that that these gentlemen and ladies deserve that and, and pay them what they're worth. It's a supply and demand uh, issue. So in summary, we talked about four uh, things. Uh, there's a variety of other ones that we could talk about, but these are four of a variety of complex issues that make finding and keeping skilled tradesmen a challenge for each of you out there. Uh, and it's only going to get more difficult in the next three to five years. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, the... Um, you know the the stats are in. You know the 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 number of people, baby boomers that are retiring, and and you know we're trying to download. Uh, companies are trying to download as much of that information as they can, and I think they need to continue to do that. Having the older guys train the train the younger individuals, but the reality too, in some cases, as we depending on how fast you're moving into some of this more sophisticated technology, right. some of that download, you know, doesn't download. Doesn't <laughs> it, does, it doesn't. I can't give you what I don't have. Yeah, exactly. So, so you know, you got a combination of things gone. But, yeah, the problem is going to continue. The, the good news, as we say, while, while you may look at this and go, this is hopeless, you know, um, we would we, – feel confident in telling you it's not hopeless. Um, You know, we always talk about the travel nursing industry dealt with this issue 30 years ago. They continue to deal with it to some degree, but you don't hear as much of it because they created a similar model to what we created, which was basically getting, getting a certain percentage of highly skilled nurses where you needed them, when you needed them. We do a similar thing in the skilled trades. They're out there. You got to provide them something that uh, really provides them a respect and a value to who they are, and then give them opportunity. And by doing that, we can get them to where you need them. Yeah. So 
you got to have new approaches, got to think things differently, look outside the box, uh, and you need new partners that can help you in this. It's what we do every day. We focus on it. Uh, we're obsessed about doing everything we can to find the very best skilled tradesmen, bring them on, and then provide them to our partners out there. And that's what we do at Skillwork. And, um, you know, we'd love to talk to you about it. Reach out to us. Uh, go to our website, skillwork.com. You can reach out to us there. There's links. One of our folks will get in touch with you and see if it's something that might work for you. And if it is, great. And we'd love to enter into a discussion with you on that. So hopefully this has been helpful to you. Some of it you may know. Maybe putting it all together in one place may be beneficial to you as you think about strategy moving forward to solve these problems in the next five, 10 years, next decade, actually, and beyond. So it's not going away. So let's address it head on. And we want to be your partner in that. Uh, until next time, Brett and Tim from Skillwork signing off saying thank you and God bless you.